So, hello everyone. Um, I can see about 10 people so far. Let me see if there are more. It was more than that. Well, Um, I like to do is um, thank you. Um, I like to kind of give an overview of where we are with instrumentation. Um, there's a lot of development programs going on right now, and uh, and then give each of you a chance to talk about what you're doing, and if you'd like to take the screen, present a slide. That if you have an illustration to kind of show your your instrument concept and then talk about um you know where we need to go are these programs adequate are we missing anything is there any major thing you think should be happening that isn't with um, other than uh you know hopes that we could really be on the moon by 2024 we should have been there 25 years ago but other than that um <laughs> so um i'll just give us song there so far you have you have an account ricky there's a hundred people. I'm not gonna have everybody introduce themselves. But I can see the list is growing. Uh, that's lots of people. All right. I mean, everybody is. If you uh, need to, if you want to say something, um, on your, unmute yourself and feel free to do so. Yeah, I think that's okay. So just watch and see who else is like, because I think everybody can see the participant list. So if there's anybody who's, uh, I guess you could also raise your hand for Ricky if you want to say something. And um, I'm not seeing it because I'm too involved in saying something or what's on the screen. So, so as I said, the goals of the meeting kind of give an overview of the development of instrumentation status. Um, and then each of us can give examples of current in instruments, small instrument packages, vision concepts that we're working on. Um, whether we're missing anything, are we complete, do we need other programs? And then one of the things I'd like to do is if you want to send me your information on the instruments, I'll add that to my presentation and let's see that it gets disseminated. This is also being recorded, by the way. So I don't mean to make an eye chart here, but I just want to sh show you that we have a lot of instruments um, that can provide input to the identified planetary decadal survey goals. Um, and especially in what's been going on in a lot of these in, in this instrumentation is that we have a lot of um, the kind of latest state-of-the-art technology detector systems, relatively compact systems that have been developed in a lot of these areas. And so, you know, there's a lot that we can do and specifically, of course, a lot of these things involving uh, involve the big push right now, which is the lunar initiative in terms of answering these questions in regard to the moon and opportunities to put instrumentation on the lunar surface or in lunar orbit that um, will, will give us a lot of input on these situ measurements plus orbital measurements. A big emphasis on in situ measurements, I think, because uh, we're looking for volatile distribution and the kind of resolution we, we, we need to go to the next level with volatiles, I believe, really requires in situ observations. I'd like to see long term in situ observations from permanent stations on the moon, as well as roving platforms that can uh, do traverses that can get us information about the in situ environment on the moon. And then, what is it, as we know now, maybe 10 years ago, people, people didn't believe this is actually a pretty happening kind of place. We have, we have an exosphere. We have volatiles, we apparently have some buried volatiles, we have interactions going on with charged particles. Um, and there's a lot of concerns because of those interactions with charged particles that we could potentially have some safety hazards. Um, anyway, there's lots of interesting work to be done, as everybody knows. So I just want to point, this is, an, I stole this, this uh, slide from Tony Freeman and updated it. This shows you kind of in the area of very small instruments. Um, where even less than 10 years ago, there were a lot of these instruments that provide information. Um, and these are focused on Earth applications, but many of them are also applicable to Mars or the moon or other places. Um, that we really had, a, there were inf infeasible, a lot of problematic areas. Now in 2000, 2020, it's virtually none of these areas that provide microwave, X-ray, gamma ray, neutron, infrared, visible UV information that we don't have some examples of uh, 
instruments for or instruments that are under development. In some cases, um, even in the area of radar, which people thought was completely infeasible, we actually are flying a, a CubeSat radar rain cube at this point. And there's further wor work going on in making much more compact active systems as well as passive systems. So what we have on the books for current or planned missions for the moon are listed here. Probably most people are familiar with these. Three, uh, four actually, lunar flashlight, lunar cube, lunar ice cube, lunar map, and sky fire. We'll get um, various kinds of data on the lunar surface, so get in quotes, science data. Three of these will ultimately deliver data to the planetary data system. And the focus is uh, for, for all of for the, these three, uh, the first three, on various kinds of information relevant to the water cycle on the moon. In two cases, polar, looking for you know, indications of polar uh, ice, and the other case for, for lunar ice cube, we're looking for distribution of various kinds of water absorption features, soil water in various forms as a function of time of day over a several month period. Lunar Ice Cube is the most operationally complex CubeSat mission that anybody's ever tried to fly. And I should point out that all of us for building six U CubeSats in the lunar environment, especially if you're flying an infrared instrument, it's very, very challenging. One of the areas that needs to develop that we're actually working on at JPL and at other places is a very state-of-the-art, extremely efficient, um, thermal protection components uh, that will allow us to fly, still fly relatively small payloads without having to resort to relatively expensive uh, radioisotopes. Um, so we have plans already to fly Artemis II. Of course, we'd really like to get Artemis I launch. I think the official launch date is airing is 2021 at this point. Viper uh, is supposed to be, is, is under development. The instruments um, are TRL-6 at this point. Um, Planning on uh, having a small uh, lander, uh, it'd be, it's the it's a version of a uh, prospector. Basically, it's, it has the instruments that'll provide in situ information on uh, water, surface water, uh, subsurface water. Has a drilling drilling platform. Prime One has a, a surface is a, a tech demo of a drill, um, and um, then the Prism program is. Nobody, ha we, we haven't gotten the word yet. Supposedly the word's going to come out any day now as to which of these um, RFIs are in encouraged to go on to, to step two. I know we put in a lot of uh, proposals for the RFIs at, at JPL. Uh, Lunar Trailblazer is one of the uh, potential selectees for discovery program, and that basically will be higher uh, surface water distribution map than anyone has ever produced before, plus uh, mineralogy. Uh, from orbit um, down to as, as much as 100 meters uh, from, from orbit for uh, water-related features and mineralogy. Um, lunar orbit platform gateway, haven't heard much about it lately, but um, that could provide lots of opportunities to put things into orbit, in cislunar space, or even get things down to the lunar surface. And the lunar geophysical network is still considered to be high priority in the New Frontiers program. Probably it's a good chance of being selected next time around. I add these these at the bottom because these are several instruments that were selected under the Simplex program, and the Simplex opportunity came up that were actually um, actually got given some money for further development, which include a, a, a hydrogen al albedo instrument that can detect a neutral hydrogen in, in, from orbit, the Mars micro orbiter, to, to has, which will is, is a sounder for the Mars atmosphere, um, a, a, a small um, asteroid instrument um, uh, with an ion drive to take images of an asteroid close up, and CubePace, which is a microgravity experiment. All these were actually given some funding to this Simplex program and not talked about very much, but... Now, what about, what about now? So we've got a number of programs. We still have Picasso and Matisse in Planetary. In addition to the NPLP and CLIPS programs, there was at least a couple rounds of selections, which I will talk about. Dolly. Um, recently, uh, people put in proposals recently, I guess they were due about, well, I can't remember, <laughs> I think it was sometime in uh, about a week or two ago. So, program, still so iterations of the Simplex program. Um, then there's a, there's a number of proposals that have selected to develop accompanying technologies that will make putting instruments on the moon possible through STMD. Um, that's of course, 
the Artemis opportunities for, for cubes. So that's the flying 13 on Artemis 1. Um, there are a number of ways to develop instrumentation through other NASA um, divisions. So Earth Ops, Helio, Astro, Earth, all of them have more opportunities to fly things in, um, in Earth orbits. Um, and they have specifically focused programs for technology, probably more than um, until recently, in, until the SMD program did with the, uh, with the Lunar Initiative. And then, of course, there's PRISM, which we'll see how PRISM goes. The first round will be selectees will be coming up and be working on proposals probably to be delivered sometime uh, in the fall. Currently, we have preliminary selections for Simplex, which include Lunar Trailblazer, which I mentioned earlier, and then two other potential missions, uh, Janus, which is a reconnaissance mission to, to binary asteroids um, through Dan, Dan Shears at the University of Colorado, um, to look at binary asteroids close up, escape and plasma acceleration dynamics explorers. Um, that's basically to characterize multiple scales the acceleration processes driving escape from Mars atmosphere, so much more detail on the Mars um, atmosphere with multiple uh, platforms, which I, I like, always like to see. Um, this, uh, Robert Wallace at the University of California, and then Bethany Elman at Caltech is the PI for a uh, little trailblazer. These are, I mean, I, uh, you know, I went made myself go and, and some of these are kind of hard to dig up online, but these are the current, um, doll, these are the Dolly selections from 2019. Um, which include some of the presentations that were done at the special uh, league virtual meeting for instrumentation that was held uh, last February. And many of these were presented here. So we've got a neutron spectrometer, a, a, a mass spec laser combination to get a calcium argon seismometer, compact image, spectro another compact spectrometer, um, a lunar environmental monitor, which includes a mass spec, another mass spec and seismometer. Mass spec is very popular. Another way to get at lunar volatiles with sub millimeter observations. Um, uh, another seismometer, this, this one from JPL. Um, then we have this crater is, a, is basically does, does include a uh, laser and, and, and mass spec, as I recall. A uh, regolith analyzer, laser source, mass spec, and uh, electrostatic dust analyzer. That was the Route 2019 round of Dolly selections. Also selected were the science technology investigations, which include the list I've given here. Um, not necessarily as widely discussed in SMD, but um, uh, a, a lot of uh, developments in um, instrumentation, uh, sounders. So this, these are these require some technology. But these are new technology kind of instruments. Um, uh, one here for the retroreflector, which people have been trying to fly for a long time, the compact imaging system. Um, the uh, sub subsurface instrument, Planet Fact, which is a sample collection uh, system that's been developed by Honeybee Robotics. Um, so a lot of um, technology support. And then another group selected also um, that are supposed to be ready to fly. We almost had something selected at JPL, but so there, there, this, this is a list here. So this is another mass spectrometer, low frequency radio observations, through descent and landing um, support, stereo cameras, uh, exosphere navigation support. Uh, again, um, a lot of these um, trans spectrometer. So a lot of instru potential instrumentation here. Now I'm just giving a list of some of um, our recent very low swap lunar surface instrument and instrument suite candidates that I talked about at the lunar um, surface science workshop. Um, some of these I'm involved with, so one of the things I'm involved with, which we proposed to Dolly, is an IR in situ, very compact, using state-of-the-art um, thermal protection technology, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it is uh, gimbaled to allow an extremely large field of view, 180 by 90 degrees around the Around a, a platform, um, and it's we have a built we have a cryo cooler and a capability to be able to see absorption features related to water up to six microns, so that we'll be able to separate hydroxyl and uh, molecular water in particular. And the idea basically is to is to put one of these down at a particular location and look at what happens at a at a location on the ground 
on a scale of millimeters to, to meters as a function of time of day over a number of lunar cycles. The idea is to get some real instance, kind of ground truth information. Um, so let's see. I wanted to, my, one other thing I meant to mention before opening up the floor to discuss to inter, in, in, you know, to interaction with other people is to, that um, we have gotten some funding from STM DHAPL to develop a generic yet reconfigurable approach to packaging small instruments, a variety of types of instruments, which range from seismometers to magnetometers to various kinds of spectrometers to particle analyzers. Um, and the idea is to come up, we have high, high, uh, highly efficient, uh, very high efficiency um, components like thermal switches, uh, high performance MLI, um, the, a, a new kind of packaging system that is extremely efficient. And to combine these, um, and David Bugby, who's uh, leading this effort, is also talking about other efforts in particular to replace uh, cryocoolers, which are major power drivers, which involve new kinds of materials. So all of this is under development and within the, and under the next three years, we'll be coming up with a, with a basic concept for this instrumentation. And one of the things I've been doing is collecting a lot of requirements information from a variety of different instruments to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks that we should be addressing in terms of dealing with the particular needs of different instruments. And different instruments, of course, have different kinds of thermal challenges, um, how, you know, duty cycles, um, apertures, uh, booms, anything that basically means that, that, yeah, that, that there'll be a challenge to uh, heat trapping, heat or, um, or basically being either, either trapping heat or being, getting rid of heat. So um, and this is called pallet. So I would like to do, what I'd like to do now is um, open up the floor to other people to, uh, I know that I have a presentation from at least one person and I just like to the easiest thing for me is just to give people the screen if they like to present something. So would you um, let Ricky Guest know by raising your hand if you'd like to grab the screen and and uh, do and and talk about your particular instrument or or just talk. You know you don't have to have a, a slide. So I will stop sharing this. So other people. I know um, Arjun Pallet had something from Ed Patrick's group at SWRI. Hey, uh, I'm Arjun. Uh, can I share the screen now, or am I waiting in line for something? Can you, Ricky? Can you? I think you can probably see that little, that little icon across the bottom and and grab it. The third one from the left. Yes. I'm just trying to get this up. All right, can you can y'all hear me? Yes, and we can Perfect. see. Sure. So I'm with the uh, Wex Foundation, and we have developed or working with a uh, quartz crystal microbalance, which is if you look at the the picture on the first slide over here where my mouse is, is basically a spherical quartz, and it oscillates at about 10 megahertz, and it detects mass by um, as mass lands on it, the frequencies and you get a you get a shift in the frequency, and there is a there is a inverse relationship between the mass and frequency where um, using the Sarbray equation and a bunch of other maths, um, uh, an appropriate and approximate um, value of mass that lands on the crystal area active crystal area is detected. Um, we are currently in a vacuum chamber, a small vacuum, and um, a dusty thermal vacuum chamber in Korea, trying to estimate the maximum load that can fall on the crystal before it maxes out, which is currently estimated around 14.78 nanograms. Um, it, is, it is smaller than that, but it is approximate because we do not know the initial, a stable initial value. Um, we we um, are trying to in a clean room where we can estimate the initial frequency at 10 megahertz with external disturbances if it was on the lunar. 
um, we there are other tests that we have that we would want to capture the dust that falls on the crystal area using um, Apizon H on the QCM crystal and um, estimate like estimating for the um, frequency shift because of the vacuum grease on the crystal. Um, we also we will also like have um, the testing of the outgassing effects on the housing material um, under high vacuum pressure with other tests that we have planned for the future. But as of right now, we just run tests trying to calculate the dust variation in a certain amount of time in vacuum chambers uh, in our lab. And we, we plan or hope to have this sent to the lunar surface and we developed a housing structure and a pyramid structure. So on the fourth slide, we have a pyramid structure, which is our initial housing system to house five crystals to, um, to capture dust on all five sides open to the air on the lunar surface and basically approximate um, the, the changes in uh, the temperature because there is a relationship between the temperature and frequency. We would like to see how the effects of the dust accumulation rates changes by location, the, the day and night and all that. So we have a temperature sensor and the quartz crystal balance um, each blue square over here on all four, on all five sides to, to capture it all. Um, the protective structure on top, um, I'm going to hand this over to Gabriella to talk her section. Um, are you online? Hi, AJ. Yes. Um, Alex, uh, will be presenting this, um, this bit, so he'll take it away from here. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, hi, my name is Alex. Um, our team is currently focused on the protective structure in the second slide. Uh, it's a one-time deployable uh, lunar dust cover. This protective structure uh, purpose is to protect the QCM housing um, from during launch and landing and uh, before um, the mission starts. Uh, its job is also to protect the QCM housing um, from lunar dust particulates uh, from entering in before um, the, the actual mission starts. Uh, this lightweight structure is, is uh, currently about less than a kilogram. Uh, we're currently working on uh, further reducing that mass uh, as much as we can. Is this for the whole instrument or just for the dust cover? This is for the whole instrument. So if you see the, the little opaque uh, pyramid inside, uh, that's the QCM housing uh, that was shown on the, th on the uh, fourth slide of the presentation. Uh, so essentially, it's like a housing within a housing. You can think of it. Um, but basically how this works is a, a pin puller uh, receives an electrical signal. The pin is released from the latch, as you can see in the anim in the animation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's spring loaded. So the housing will essentially uh, open up um, with a springs moment applied to it, and it doesn't uh, retract back or anything. It's resettable by hand, but there is um, currently no um, retractable mechanism for it. Uh, this is, uh, again, a one-time uh, deployable dust cover. And uh, that that's currently our project right now, what we're working on. What, what does this, um, what kind of operational conditions can, can this operate in? Is there any special thermal constraints? Can it sit right on a lander deck um, in a lunar environment without any special thermal protection? So, yes, uh, great question. It does require um, some thermal conditions. So currently what the operating range we're working on is from negative 30 Celsius to about 200 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's uh, based upon the Astrobotics payload user guide. Uh, that's where we are basing our values upon. Oh, this is for operation during lunar day. Yes, ma'am. This is for a lunar day. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so this mission starts on uh, during lunar day. 
I see. So you're not trying to survive Lunar Night. So you can collect no, dust man. for a long period of time. No man. Once lunar night comes, then the the mission is done. It, it'll be, come dead essentially. Okay, so those are the conditions that exist. That'll exist where they land, basically up to four hundred k. So. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, be nice to see if you could operate it during lunar night too. Uh, that that is a, a future goal of ours is to uh, have it fully operate uh, during lunar day and lunar night, uh, but that's sometime in the future. Uh, currently, we're uh, working on just getting this cool. to be actually deployable. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Anybody else have anything? Any comments on this? Is this deployed on the surface of the moon or on the lander? I think it's right on the lander, Jack, right? It will be mounted on the lander. They don't have to move it, just sits there and opens up, basically. Yeah. So the reason we have one on each side is to accommodate for if a rover was being deployed or if there was some disturbance on the surface that disturbed the, uh, the dust around the area. So we have one on each different position just to accommodate for in, you know, something that happened while, during landing. Good. Well, thank you. So who else would like to talk about what they're working on? One. So Ed, what are you doing these days? Did you say Ed? I did, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I'm babysitting an extreme high vacuum system that I'm cooling down right now for uh, so, some small tasks for Mass Specs Europa. But, uh, and uh, working on some uh, proposals for lunar stuff, of course. It's mm -hmm. become a giant whack-a-mole game now. In what way? <laughs> It's just, well, you could spend all your time writing proposals just for lunar instruments. That's true. So that, that for me, it's like, well, I, I'm going to have to do some triage. I can't, I can't, I can't get to all of them. And, and they seem to be coming in fast and furious. Right. So um, how many folks uh, in this group have actually uh, just I, op open your mic and say something proposed for the PRISM program? I've been involved in three proposals myself. Uh, two of them originating from JPL. Uh, one for a compact infrared instrument, another one for a little, um, a little mini prospecting, uh, passively operating uh, water detection package, which will do subsurface and surface water, another one for a plant biology experiment. Um, who else has proposed to, to the PRISM program and who's on, on the line? People unmute themselves. I guess you can put your hand up if it's hard to, if you're having a hard time getting unmuted. What about Dolly? Anybody put in Dolly? Yes. Who's speaking? Sorry, uh, had my hand up. Hi, uh, my name's Kazad. I'm at a Canadian company. Um, I guess I had my hand up prior to your question, so it, I was just here to observe, but if if there's time, I could talk about a lunar payload we're developing. Yeah, well, that was, the idea was to just give an overview and then let people have the opportunity <laughs> to talk about the instruments they were they were involved in developing to kind of exchange information. And you know some some of these have been formally presented. Some of these concepts have been formally presented, and other ones, not necessarily, you know. So go ahead, Hassan. Yeah. You may take sure. this. Um, okay, great. I think some of you may have seen this before since we've presented recently at the NESF conference as well as the Lunar Surface uh, Science, uh, Lunar Surface Science Workshop. Yeah. But I'll try to share my screen nonetheless. Thank you. 
Oh, it looks like I have to go to the desktop for that. Uh, okay, I'll try to do that while I'll talk. So this isn't quite a science instrument. What we're developing is a, a flight computer that takes in camera images and does some type of terrain assessment. So with images coming in from a lunar rover and it does some terrain assessment to identify what the scene looks like, identifies terrain classes, potentially novel or anomalous geological features. And the intent is to help speed up the, the cycle of terrain assessment for uh, science-driven lunar rover missions. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think the end goal is to be able to put in some autonomy on board the rover itself so that instruments could be autonomously targeted mm -hmm. or parts of, parts of the data could be prioritized for downlink. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you know what this is like on, on Mars through the Aegis system. So that, that's kind of an analogy I typically refer to. So it's building up those uh, science autonomy style capabilities for lunar missions. So when you say autonomy, autonomy can mean a lot of things. So um, are you talking about something that can essentially um, look for patterns and basically preserve or send back only the data where there's some kind of, some kind of a change detection? Or are you looking for something that's just capable of much faster processing? Uh, mm -hmm. Or, and, and the, what about radiation hardness? Obviously you're operating on the moon, so you probably, so what particular aspects of um, improvement for support for instruments and dealing with the little bottlenecks we have now, um, can you address with this? Yeah, so going, going in reverse to what you said, so we're partnering with a hardware company that has built embedded systems for flight, and we're working with uh, partners to do radiation analysis and uh, increase the TRL so that it's compatible with the lunar environment. Mm -hmm. uh, as for the approach and, and the purpose itself. For now, the intent is to classify types of uh, geological terrain in the image. So it's kind of like an autonomous uh, classification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, autonomous classification or annotation. So that you know might help if you're getting a lot of images to do statistical analysis on, on that, or if you have a, a high resolution panorama. Um, and, and this can be run in the ground segment as well. Uh, to to help. Thing. What does that, 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 does that require power? What kind of power are you doing this efficiently or what kind of power requirements would you have to use this? Yeah, so we're looking at two types of embedded systems from this partner company, uh, Zyphos Technologies in Canada. Mm -hmm. And specifically, we're looking at uh, Q7S or Q8S and the Q7S has a power consumption of one watt flat. Mm -hmm. Q8S, which is a much more, much more performant computer has a, a range of uh, 4 to 25 watts. So we're, we're currently undergoing a uh, type of uh, feasibility an analysis and prototyping to see what level of power draw we actually get from running these algorithms on board. And we're also exploring different ar architectures. So potentially the computer is embedded on the lander itself, but processes data from the rover so that the rover itself doesn't have to host this. Okay, so in other words, you're talking about a system that's sort of a a, a local uh, computer that is is in like a Wi-Fi network that basically it was is able to support things that are roving at a distance from a lander. Yeah, as well as um, uh, help, yeah, as well as helping process data from lander-based payloads as well. So we're kind of open to what types of applications we can put on there. Yeah. The things I've described are just the specific things that we're working on today. Okay. And are you, can you have a high throughput and a capability to support a number of different instrument data sets simultaneously? Yeah, we're working on, a, yeah, we're working on a technology that's addressing, a, we, we call it like payload data management. So. It's a technology we're hoping to uh, partner with uh, commercial lunar landers so that data from multiple payloads can be uh, handled dynamically, especially under a lot of uh, dynamic constraints and varying needs 
on ops in environmental conditions. So it's kind of a challenging problem. And you know, we're, we're looking at that as well. Well, if you want to send me like a quad chart slide, I'll include it when I make this available to people. It's a presentation. I'll add things that people send me on their sure. particular instruments. For sure. Thanks okay. for the questions. Thanks. You're, you're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? Is that? Anybody have any particular autonomy or data challenges that I think NASA should be uh, working on that we're not working on at this point? that could use some more support. Well, I'll jump in here, but not directly related, but uh, LADDIE transmitted by Green Laser, correct? Mm -hmm. Did anybody know what the data rates were for the LADDIE, that demonstration? For, I don't remember them. I don't remember what they were. Um, I just wonder if they're considering that for, you know, uh, for future. I haven't heard. Maybe somebody on the does. I haven't heard anything specifically about the use of laser technology to support communication. Um, I, I know that NASA, that there's some SBIR work. I, what I do know is that there's some SBIR work going on. Um, to look at various ways to support something called Luna, Luna net or lunar net. Um, which would provide a, a essentially communication network in cislunar space. And that there were, it was pretty wide open um, in terms of the kinds of hardware and software. Uh, Tedris for the moon. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, that's right. Something like that, but more than the moon. I mean, really cislunar space. So including the Lagrange points and uh, the earth and the moon and, and uh, lunar gateway. So they, they were talking about what protocols, you know, what kind of uh, data protocols, what kind of software, what kind of hardware combinations, how many nodes, how are they going to arrange the nodes, orbits, things like that. So that's that project. I think they're talking probably about a four or five year lead time to get people to, and you know, they're, so they're, it's in the SBIR process at the moment. That I do know about. I don't know if, if there are other people here who know more about other kinds of things that, that NASA is working on, but that's a critical problem because I can tell you that we, Certainly in developing instrumentation, one of the things I'm always aware of um, is the limitations in bandwidth. So strategies to minimize bandwidth consumption are built into my thinking when I'm developing instruments for the lunar environment. For lunar ice cube, uh, for birches, which is being built at Goddard for lunar ice cube, for example, um, uh, we're taking data for a small fraction of the day. We're in a very elliptical orbit. And only during that time we're looking at the illuminated surface. Um, and we are somewhat compromised um, in the kind of resolu spatial resolution we can get because we can only have a certain um, data accumulation rate because that's all we can download. And this is state of the art, you know, state of the art um, expand iris uh, radio technology that JPL developed to, to really increase the bandwidth by several times over what we would initially have, but still we're, we're extremely constrained. Um, for silver, worth, one of the ways we're dealing with uh, bandwidth limitation is to take essentially think of taking snapshots for a limited period of times as a function of time of day. Um, so that we're looking, well, we're, most of our activity is focused when we have the most change and otherwise we're very rarely taking snapshots. So that's, that's these are different strategies. So the other area that, um, yeah. That in some um, that I've been involved in proposals that propose to use is looking at change detection algorithms, which is tricky because there's a lot of natural changes, and so you have to be you have to do work ahead of time to figure out what's natural background and what's real change. But pushing on development of change detection algorithms that that can operate well in various kinds of planetary environments is also a way to minimize the the you know the basically the bandwidth you require to send data back, you can, you can take, take the data and um, store it for a while and then only send back the, you know, send back a, a basic data set and then you just look for change. That re reduces the amount. It, it's, it changes the algorithm a lot for what most people are used to thinking about sending back all the data, um, but using change detection algorithms or figuring out ways to process in place and 
send back a second order product once you've done the processing. It means you have to have a lot of faith in the systems you're developing. that They're actually going to do what you want them to do. But um, that's an area I think we could probably use some help until we get these, you know, basically uh, high volume, high bandwidth support networks in place, which is going to take a little, uh, a little time. You know, I suggest that probably within five years we'll have something a little better, but the, um, yeah, the uh, space network has been, of course, um, heavily constrained um, for years now and has been looking to expand because they're, you know, they're bandwidth constrained also. They have to limit what they can take in because they're, you know, they, they're, they're looking at so many different spacecraft all over the solar system. So is there anybody? Yes, I think somebody wants to share. I saw somebody. No, oh, nobody has their hand raised. Okay. I want this to read. So if people would like to share something, pl please do. Um, what other, what um, areas in particular um, do you think we need to do that NASA could do some, do more development of instrumentation? Are we neglecting anything? I'd like to hear people's comments on that. Great silence. Okay. Could so, you repeat that, Pam? Can you? Can you, are you having a hard time hearing me? Because that's also a possibility. I'm just asking people what they, where areas they think we may be lacking in instrument or technology development. Are, do we have any holes? Are there things that we need to be considering? Are there any new developments that well, have been overlooked? I, I can tell you what thrills me the most is discussing the placement of multiple landers on the moon long term to monitor what's changing over decades or you know whenever a mission comes along or somebody's landing a spacecraft nearby or or not nearby i i think we've never had a network there because well i don't know what there, there are lots of arguments why we haven't done more in 50 years but <laughs> but, but we know more now Okay, we, we there were a lot of bad assumptions originally. Ah, eh, the moon, it's boring. Eh, you know, there's nothing there. And now we know their their volatiles do play a role at the poles, and and I suspect elsewhere. But I'm biased. Absolutely, I think that um, one of the ways we can greatly benefit from tech, the, the technologies that develop further development of the miniaturization trend that NASA started over 50 years ago, with the uh, CubeSat paradigm to miniaturize as much as possible. Um, we have the. We are now on the threshold of a capability to distributed networks, which I find truly exciting because for the first time, we'd be able to have in situ monitoring um, observations, um, temporally and spatially distributed, to look at whole systems, things going on in three or four places at once, things happening at different times of day, things happening uh, spatially in different places, transient changes with the separating out. Uh, regular cyclical changes from transient changes that are induced, for example, on the moon by solar activity. I mean, all of these things would really require a network of um, stations. They could be they could be stationary. They could be landed with a small commercial lander. Actually, one of the things that um, I proposed for for a, a, a white paper for the um, PCMS study was a network of instruments with a small suite of instruments that would essentially characterize the water cycle, um, including subsurface water. And just stay there. And they'd be distributed, maybe a minimum of five of them distributed um, all over the lunar surface, so that we have uh, ongoing observations. Um, and you know, one of the challenges for this is having to operate during lunar night. But with the in, with the development of this, the new uh, thermal technologies that will allow operation on much colder for much longer conditions, that is possible to operate on at least a limited duty cycle. I mean, it's possible to think of things that require power, even potentially more power that would, would operate at least uh, off and on during lunar night, like mass spectrometers, for example, um, and, and breakthroughs that make things much smaller. So, yeah, I'm really on that page, Ed, and I, I'm a great proponent of, of moving to the distributed network. Um, I would say that when we get to the point where we can do that comfortably, there are some challenges. Um, we can talk about those, but we will have a major paradigm shift. We will really start to look at bodies as whole systems. Yeah, and uh, I would say uh, mass spectrometers can can triangulate too. Yes. So well, we're going to be up there. We're we're going to be up there one day when we get a, a, a significant impactor. 
and 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 people's instruments are going to be going off and we're going to want to know hey what what did the size what did your seismometer say hey what was picked up on the dust detector hey what came came through on the mass spectrometer you know it's we're, we we will be probing the lunar surface using the natural you know the the impactors and the and the solar wind and the, yes. the meteor showers and the meteoric infall and all that and you can do that when you have this kind of a network cuz you know what's a transient what's a one time only and what's ongoing you don't want to make as many assumptions about it. The big challenge as I see it, and sooner or later there'll be a proposal funded that'll bite this bullet, is when you're building more than two or three of something, when you're building say 20 of something, you know, 50 of something, the big challenge is coming up with an acceptable development paradigm because you can't, you can't treat this, you, you, you can't do this in the, in the classic, you know, class A fashion. So. There'll have to be ways of doing parts testing, um, uh, simultaneous um, batch calibrations um, involving um, universities or the private sector in ways that lower cost. Um, and what will be adequate in terms of uh, NASA oversight? I mean, all of these things, sooner or later, I mean, I, I, I feel that at least a couple of us have gotten close in getting selected to go to the next level with this, to actually try this out. And keep within a cost cap, um, but the way, of course, you know, the, it means having a new kind of relationship to risk because one of the ways that you deal with risk if you're building multiple systems is you you do things that are good enough to get a certain percentage of your systems to function, and you still have met your threshold requirements. So, the idea is to is when you're developing something that's that where where you know you may like a lot more, but coming up with requirements that are are, are, are meetable. And then exceeding them in some cases is a probably a better strategy. So I don't know if anybody else here has strong feelings about multiple platforms um, as a really wonderful option that we wish we had more of, but, but I, I certainly do. I'd like somebody else to comment on that. I think Ed and I are kind of in violent agreement. Anybody else see any other challenges that? Pam, can you hear me? Yes. Who's, who's speaking, please? Uh, this is Carol Stoker. Um, as you know, there was this uh, lunar uh, seismology multiple lander mission that was an internet, supposed to be an international cl collaboration. And mm -hmm. it seems like the PRISM or the CLIPS program would be a great way to implement that science because you just put seismometers on any of these many landers that are going to be going. Uh, you have that network. Do you know of anything is coming together along those lines? Um, I, I know that there are a number of, of compact seismometers under development and I've, I've some, you know, some of them through the various programs that we talked about a little earlier. Um, and I, I know that the, um, that uh, Clive Neal is very much involved in the effort to have uh, multiple landed uh, seismic stations on the moon as part of the frontier program when the announcement comes out. Um, and I do agree that, in fact, I think what will happen before that even happens is that, that, um, one or more of the, the next group of landers that lands on the moon will have a seismometer. So possibly by, you know, we'll have a seismometer that'll fly. And of course we want to have a network rather than one, but if that's successful, then that'll put, put a big push on things. And you know, these, these seismometers are, do not require a lot of power. They're relatively compact. I mean, it is true that highly desirable would be careful placement for some of these, but on the other hand, there, there are ways that you can model effects um, out if you stand a lander. And if you have a network, you have a lot of different information, which helps to give you, um, it helps you to deal with the noise problem, for example. Both of those strategies would help to do that. So um, I think there are ways to, to put um, a seismometers. And I also know that there are efforts that, um, to do um, impactors that, that carry seismometers in them. That, that, that people haven't given up on that idea. They're, People I think talking about impactors for a lot of things and, and including seismometers. So, um, yeah, well, I can see you, you can tell that there's a lot of interest in seismometers because at least there's at least two Dolly, um, at least two Dolly efforts that involve seismometers that were selected to go forward. I think folks are actively thinking about how, you know, wondering how we can do this. And the, I like the idea of actually proposing to do. A, a deliberately connected network, but you can also do a heterogeneous network as well. So you could have you could have 
uh, several different seismometers, maybe not built by the same people, that could also operate in the same way. And um, it would just take longer to get everything in place, but it would, it's still, you know, it's still a way to get that, that kind of information. So when you have, once we um, break the barrier of getting the commercial landers to successfully land on the moon, and I think it opens up all kinds of possibilities. Um, just a process question. Uh, are you going to post your slide somewhere, or is there is there some central um, um, I haven't repository actually, for this kind of information? I haven't actually talked to. I mean, from this group. Well, I want yeah, and one one of the things I could do is to. Um, have people who would like to get a collection just send me an email. There's probably about 20 people, I think, at this point. Um, or I can ask the survey folks to make them available through one or, through their mail, mail distribution. Um, or I could attempt to post them through Lunar List Serve. There are a lot of different options, but you know, one way is just to have people who are interested send me an email. But I think the survey, I think um, the survey folks would be willing to do this. To put them out there for people that they sent the original um, email to. It would involve more than the people who showed up here, obviously, but that would be fine too to, to be able to do that. So yeah, I'm planning on, if you send me, you send me a slide, I'll wait about a week or so, and you can send me a slide on a current instrument project of great interest to you. Um, and I'll be happy to add that to the package. I, I, I thought maybe perhaps more people would actually have something to say with a slide, but we can just talk about it too. We don't have to have a physical slide. The idea is to stimulate discussion here and not, you know, to get away from the formality of a regular meeting, which I have to say, I think is a little harder to do in this format than a face to face meeting. But, you know, how to make an effort. Um, Pamela, can you hear me? I can, yes. Hi, um, I'm Abby. I've got some very high school looking slides because I'm not an instrumentalist in any way, but I'm happy to share them if it's going to start anybody thinking in a different direction. Okay, sure. Let me try. I'll just see whether I'm able to share. Bear with me when I play that game. Abby, where, where are you from? I'm in where? Australia, so it's just about four o'clock in the morning over here. Oh, at <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says I'm the presenter. So somebody help me with the technology. What do I need to do here? Okay, so do you see a screen that has a bunch of icons across the bottom? Is this the web page? Third one from the left. Let me just have a look. Third one from the left. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so I've clicked that. And then and then sh just say show screen. That's the easiest one. It'll give you a bunch yes. of options. Maybe five different options for what you want to show. Okay, I tried that and it didn't work. Where am I at now? Think something now. Yeah. Connect, succeed, create, combine. Yeah, that's me. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah, that's good. I can, I can okay, read. so I, um, I come from a psychology research and just general educator. I've taught in universities in a number of subjects. Um, so I come from that perspective and I'm new to instrumentation, so I'm probably horribly embarrassing myself right now. But I use this as a um, I use this as a way of just imagining what it is that everyone else is thinking about and kind of looking at it from outside of the instrument itself, I guess, as well as innovative ways to design it uh, to design instruments. So my first thought was about connecting with the public because the more I learn about this stuff, the more amazed I am at how little the rest of the public knows about what the options are and how their expertise might actually be applied. And I think that from an outsider looking in, it seems that um, connecting with the public needs to be built in so that um, the option to be able to share information or share what's happening or even just provide um, updates on social media for what instrumentation is doing has increased it. It just feels that there are some amazing resources out there for the public that really um, engage them with instrumentation for the moon and other projects in space and there could be just so much more. Um, I looked at the succeed don't fail thing because obviously the best way to get famous is to have your instrument fail but it's the worst outcome. <laughs> 
And I think when we're looking at instrumentation, it then probes and um, rovers that are going to go up before there's people on the moon to operate them or repair them. That's obviously a really big consideration because you don't have someone that can, you know, make a filter out of socks like they do on Apollo 13 or recombine the bits and pieces of instruments that are already up there until we get to the stage where we can send robots up that can repair instrumentation that's already on the moon. Um, new functionality, I was thinking about um, maybe instead of the idea of landing something in one spot and leaving it there, you could combine instruments with concepts of rovers, for example, swarms of little cockroach-sized things that can run away and get samples from further places, the idea of dropping things off on the way to a landing zone. Uh-huh. Um, and, and maybe it doesn't. about that. Yep. So you drop right. things off. Yep. Breadcrumbs. Yeah, so maybe it doesn't need to all end up in the one spot that can be left as a trail and then just it only has to be able to communicate as far as your instrument or someone else's instrument on the surface itself and then that other instrument can bring back data. So you're um, obviously having to deal with a lot shorter range of communication from those little gadgets that you might leave out on different parts of the moon. Um, I was thinking about a whole lot of other options. You can see some there. I woke up in a funny position coming into this and thought about whether you could um, have an instrument that lands more like an armadillo and unfurls itself to do things kind of, I guess, like a rover does, but on a miniature scale. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously combining with others. So you don't all have to send a camera up there to record um, what it is that your project is doing. But if you can co cooperate with someone else who can afford to do that and then use your um, project, I guess, from their photos to really make some difference in that social media space and really engage the imagination of our future scientists and our investors that really don't understand how much is going on in this area at the moment. So that was my little high school production uh, <laughs> of <laughs> where my thinking was at with all of these. It's really important to think, and thank you for sharing that, because it's really important to think of these things when, when dealing with the public or with dealing with people who could be educated lay persons either who would find this kind of thing really exciting. So, you know, I, in terms of the success business, I think one of the most compelling and exciting things is when there's a problem and it, get, it gets fixed by a lot of cleverness. One of them, the, the, of course, the good example you gave, Apollo 13. But there also were um, issues the first time um, that we tried to do a rendezvous and docking in orbit. It had to be kind of thought out and fixed in real time. Um, the, uh, the, um, yeah, I mean that that kind of thing, or or um, when the um, we we put the uh, space telescope up, and uh, there was a problem with the lens, so the not the astronauts going up to put what I like to say put on glasses, so they could see, and you know that kind of thing I think is very compelling, and of course, truly in when you want breakthroughs in science or engineering, we we learn from our mistakes because you never do anything. You weren't willing to make a mistake. When you have an idea and you're testing it, of course you're going to fail. Of course you're not always going to identify the right question to ask or to get some unexpected result that you can't explain, which is what makes science so interesting and compelling for real scientists, which I think sometimes the way science is taught has a bunch of rules, but there are laws that have to be followed. And for most scientists, it's more like questions. Questions are really what drives the process things that don't fit the paradigm and um, designs and engineering, you know, that we thought we got something to work and there's still a problem. We have to fix it. We have to develop something new to fix something or a new component that'll make something happen that could never happen before. Um, the drive that went on when um, the Apollo astronauts and Apollo 15 started to do the first drill course, the drill didn't work and they ripped off their fingernails trying to get the drill into the ground. So one of the things they did was to, redesign the drill bits and the next time around by 17 they actually had some drill cores work it's still not easy to get because it's the moon is regular this stuff to deal with but but that kind of failure leads to innovation which is great so that's, i think it's really important and to for people to start thinking about science and engineering that way and th those were good points that you made abby thanks for sharing that thank you thank you for your time yeah sure
So anybody else want? We're we're getting we're winding down in terms of time. Uh, anybody else want to share something? Since you've brought up failure, then uh, it motivates me to actually share something. If that's okay, my name is Phil First from Georgia Tech, uh, and I don't know that I'm in the right uh, focus group, but we'll see. Uh, so I hope this shows what we've been uh, looking at are ways to do, uh, sorry, I'm looking for that darn full screen, ways to do uh, dosimetry. Uh, and so we've been working on the uh, reveals project, which is a, a survey funded project. And uh, uh, the motivation for this is that basically uh, space radiation really is pervasive. It's there all the time and we have to know about it. And so uh, as anybody in these days knows, what you need is testing, testing, testing. And to do that, you need cheap and fairly rapid things that do the testing. And so what we have, <clears throat> excuse me, envisioned is to do this ubiquitous radiation dosimetry on everything, uh, on people, places, things, things that would be tags that you could basically uh, think about like a, an RFID tag that nowadays people come around and, and easily scan. Uh, or alternatively, it could be a smart tag where uh, it has its own radiation, uh, sorry, its own wireless connection, for instance, with a, with a network. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our uh, uh, concept is to choose a material property. Uh, the material property is resistance, something that can be measured over 12 orders of magnitude. Uh, we think we have some ways to make metamaterials that are designed specifically for uh, radiation sensing. Um, and, you know, I've just given a, a tiny little <laughs> child's drawing up here, but essentially these would be, could be done by additive manufacturing or laser cutting, things that can be done very, very cheaply uh, that you could create a tag um, or it can be embedded in a larger system. This seems like this, this suit. Yeah, or, or you could put this on an astronaut suit. Exactly. I mean, that was the, that was the original uh, the original thought. So we were uh, working with um, working with the HEOD uh, sort of ASP, H, I, I don't I don't I'm so new to NASA. I don't know the acronym. HEOMD. Uh, right. Right. Um, anyhow, this is uh, uh, it's, it's not a payload exactly. We're working on trying to develop these, the metamaterials themselves to get this beyond two or so. Uh, I have a company in Austin, Texas that would like to uh, get more involved and they have some appropriate uh, technical skills to help us with this. Okay. And I'm gonna try to figure out how to unshare now. Uh, go to the top of your screen. It says probably an orange thing across the right. sharing. Got it. Please send me your slide. You know, anybody who has, has um, shared and share a slide, please send me that slide and I'll put it in the presentation. Or if there are other people who would like to submit slides to put into this, this collection, please, please do so. And I'll give people about a week before I'll try to, to, to put it somewhere that, and you'll be on the, the uh, email distribution so that you'll know you'll be on the list, lunar list server or, or uh, survey district mail distribution, email distribution. Okay. Well, any last, let me see, you know, I just saw the chat room. See, I think I saw the chat room. See? Peter Chi. Ah, okay. So Peter's um, few colleagues have submitted a Prism RFI and a space environment package on both lander and small rover. We welcome collaboration with interested parties. Cool. Okay. That's good. Okay. Radiation. Thank you. And something from Ron Wells. I think everybody sees it. Okay, great. So thank you very much, people. We'll We'll do this again sometime. If, if let me know what you think. I, I wanted to keep it informal. I, I want to have more informal interaction. We have plenty of formal interactions online, and those are good. But this is it's nice to supplement that with a little bit more informal interaction with each other since we don't have any FaceTime at the moment. So thank you very much, and thank you, Ricky, for uh, setting this up.